If you have your Bibles, I wish you would turn with us, please, to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Deadline number one, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost to commit the unpardonable sin. What is that sin? Which member of the body do you use in committing that sin? And how long may you expect to live if you commit that sin? I believe that all of you will agree with me that before you can understand any portion of the Word of God, the first rule it must be to examine that passage of Scripture in the light of its proper context. What was the occasion when our Lord gave the doctrine of the unpardonable sin? The Bible says that they had brought to our Lord a man that was possessed with a dual devil, a devil of blindness and a devil of dumbness. And our Lord had healed that man insomuch that he both spake and saw. Now the Pharisees were always present at all of the public meetings of our Lord. Pastor Henry, I've searched the Bible diligently and I cannot find anywhere where our Lord had a public gathering that the Pharisees were not there. And they always sat on the front row. <laughs> you never found them in the balcony. You never found them sitting on the very back pew. They were on the front row. Not in order that they might better hear the Lord, but in order that they might find some fault with him whereby they could put him to death or bring some charge against him. Now, after witnessing this wonderful and marvelous miracle, they were about to lose face. The people were saying, if this man is all that you say that he is, then how and what is your explanation for this wonderful and marvelous miracle? And they had to come up with an answer. And they said, the thing that you poor, ignorant people do not understand is that this man has indeed performed a tremendous miracle, but he did it by the power of Beelzebub. Now, Beelzebub means the prince of devils. It means the prince of filth. It means the prince of flies. It means the prince of the dunghill. And when our Lord heard that accusation, he turned. And with anger, he looked in his, their faces and said, you may speak a word against me, but whosoever speaketh the word against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now the Bible very plainly teaches that all that Jesus did while he was here upon this earth, he did by the power of the third person of the Trinity. So he performed this miracle by the power of the Holy Ghost. And when these Pharisees accredited that work to the devil or to the prince of devils, Jesus said, you have committed a sin whereby you shall never be forgiven in this world nor in the world to come. That brings to my mind the word unpardonable. The word unpardonable is a very harsh, hard, and oftentimes a misunderstood word because we examine things in the scope and the light of our ability to forgive. But when we examine a thing in the scope and the light of God's ability to forgive, we find that nothing, absolutely nothing, is unforgivable but the blaspheming against the Holy Ghost. There have been some things that have happened recently that all of us have heard about on television that when I first heard it, I said it's unforgivable. For example, three days ago, Right here in Kissimmee, when somebody drove up by the side of another car, and when the man got out of the car, shot him dead in the middle of the highway. When I first heard that, I said, that's unforgivable. But wherever that man is that did that horrible thing, wherever he is this morning, if he's listening to, by radio or television, there is room at the cross and mercy to forgive that man of that horrible sin. 
I was in Chicago, Brother Jim, when that case of Mr. Gacy was revealed. That homosexual who had murdered or had enticed 32 young men into his apartment and there in a perverted sex manner had assaulted them and then murdered all 32 of them, burying 30 of them in the basement of his home. I was there as they began to bring those bodies out one by one. And as I saw that, I said, this is unforgivable. But if you're in that Illinois prison this morning, if Mr. Gacy would get on his knees and say, oh God, I'm a homosexual, and I'm a murderer, and I've killed at least 32 young men, there would be room at the cross and mercy enough and power enough in the blood to forgive that man of that awful sin. There is not a person present, and perhaps there is not a person listening by television, but what you could bring to your mind, some horrible crime that made you shudder and the goose pimples break out on your body when you heard about it. You say, preacher, why are you telling us these things? I want to emphatically, dogmatically impress upon the mind of every person that is present here this morning that the sin that I'm talking about is worse than anything that I've mentioned or anything that you can conceive in your mind as that calls sin. This brings to my vision screaming, dying, doomed, damned men and women. I see their horrified gaze. I see their despairing look. I see their hopeless end. Now it's impossible for them to be saved. I have been diligently studying this book that I hold here before me for 55 years. And if you would ask me to look into the 66 books of this Bible and come up with what I call the quartet of the most horrible words, four words in the Bible, it wouldn't take me five seconds to tell you what I believe they are. I believe they are the four words uttered by Jesus Christ when he said, shall never be forgiven. The only person in all of the universe that can forgive sins says shall never be forgiven. There is no court of appeals. There is no supreme court. There is no higher judge to whom you may take your case of sin if once you step over this deadly deadline of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. That brings to my mind the word blaspheme. Dr. Henry, the word blaspheme comes from two Greek words meaning to speak hurtfully. So how does one commit this sin? Which member of the body do they use in committing it? Which member of the body do you use in speaking? We use the tongue. So, as I look here in the Word of God, I find in James chapter 3 and verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, and it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature. Here's what I want you to underscore. And it is set on fire of hell. God realizing that the tongue is the only member of your body with which you can commit a sin whereby you can never be forgiven has enclosed that member of your body behind a double prison wall. First of all, there are the ivory bars, your teeth. Second, there is the fleshy mold of your lips. And coiled up back there is that one little member of your body that can commit a sin whereby you can never be forgiven in this world nor in the world to come. I have never known a woman to commit this sin in my 55 years of preaching. I have only known 21 men to commit this sin. And not a one of them lived 24 hours. And nowhere in the Bible can I find where they committed this sin that any individual or group of individuals lived over 24 hours. If you have your Bibles, I wish you would turn to Numbers chapter 16. And here in Numbers 16 and verse 29, 
We have one of the most tremendous verses in all of the Bible. Remember that Dothan and Abram and Korah had come against Moses, saying that this great man, and I think that Moses was the greatest Jew that ever lived, other than our wonderful Lord. They had said that God had not sent him. And they were stirring up a rebellion against Moses. There were 250 in that group. And on the sideline, there were 14,500 saying amen to what they were doing. Now listen what happened. The Bible says here in Numbers chapter 16 and verse 29, If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then hath the Lord not sent me. Verse 30, But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. Now what happened? The Bible said as soon as Moses prayed that prayer, God jerked the earth out from under them, and all 250 of them, with all that appertained to them, went down into a great pit, and God closed up the pit again. And on the sideline, 14,500 others died. And so to speak against God's servant, if Moses, and if our wonderful Lord, could never do one thing unless they did it by the power of the Holy Spirit, then I want to ask you, is it possible for any man or woman to do anything for God without the power of the Holy Spirit? Impossible. I have only known 21 men to commit this sin. I have never known a woman, as I said a moment ago, to commit it. I was holding a revival meeting in a little Georgia town in a wonderful little church. I had preached on Thursday night. I do not remember what the sermon was. It was not this message. But as I gave the invitation, 25 or 30 people had walked down the aisle, and I saw a young man stand up on the very back pew of the church and begin to look over the audience. He was standing up on the seat part of the pew. I was impressed by the Holy Spirit to go back and speak to him. I went back and before he knew I was on my way, I was right in front of him and I looked up into his face and I said, young man, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you saved? And before I could utter another word, he turned on me like a vicious animal and he said, listen here, J. Harold Smith, I did not come here to hear you preach. No, I'm not saved. And for your information, I do not want to be saved. I came here tonight to find a couple of girls to go to a dance and as soon as I can locate them, you can have our space. God is my witness, as kindly as I could say it. I said, son, I believe that the Holy Ghost sent me back here, the Holy Spirit sent me back here to speak to you about your soul. He cut me off again. He said, I told you, sir, that I did not come here to hear you preach. I told you a moment ago that I was not saved and that I did not want to be saved. I told you that I came here to get a couple of girls to go to a dance. He said, now you and the Holy Ghost both go to hell. As soon as he said it, I never had such an impression to get away from a man in my life. I felt that I was in the presence of a mad dog, a rattlesnake, and I backed off from him. And I said, son, son, I believe you've blasphemed against God's Holy Spirit. He pulled up his shoulders and said, oh yeah. I did not say another word. I dismissed that service. He got those two girls, he and his friend, and went to that dance hall. At five minutes of 12, according to his buddy, they stepped out on the little porch of that dance hall to take a drink of liquor and to smoke a cigarette. They lit their cigarette and his buddy said, I took a drink out of the flask and I reached across the little porch to hand it to him and he reached out to take it before he could touch the flask. He folded up like a jackknife, began to scream like a panther, fell on that little old porch. The orchestra stopped playing, the dancers stopped dancing. They called for Dr. Mays. Dr. Mays told me, he said, Preacher, 
I got to that dance hall about 5 after 1 a.m. And as I walked in and saw that young man stretched out on the dance hall floor, two things I was aware of simultaneously. Number one, that was a young man that was standing on that pew back of me in the service. And second, that he was a corpse. Before I ever touched him, I knew he was dead. And he said, if I ever examined him, I examined a body to write on the death certificate the cause of death, I examined him and finally, I had to write on the death certificate the cause of death unknown. But he said, if I'd have put on there what I know I ought to put on there, I'd have put on there, God killed him. I want to tell you, there is such a sin as blaspheming against the Holy Ghost. What is it? In a nutshell, it is a, to credit the work of the Holy Spirit to the work of the devil. And the minute you do it, you're damned forever.